that. Here we are in Romans chapter 12, uh, our sixth and final time here in the in in this chapter as we've been studying through the book of Romans and we've uh, been in Romans 12 the last several weeks as we consider the great outworking of the gospel, the legs to the gospel. We've said that the gospel is not just a one-time message to be believed, but it's a lifetime message to be embraced, that we, we work it out. Uh, so in chapter 12, it's where Paul transitions from belief to behavior, from creed to conduct, from doctrine to duty, from exposition to exhortation. That's B, C, D, and E if you're taking notes. And, um, and, uh, but today we come to this final portion where scarcely, I don't know if there's a, a more clear way then the gospel's walked out in this life. And that's when we are kind and gracious to difficult people or when we bless those who have persecuted us and come against us. It's the gospel itself. And so if you are a Christian here today, the Lord calls you to do good to those who hate you. In light of the gospel, where that has taken place chiefly and that God has done us good, although we hated him. And so let us read this text uh, before us and uh, want to to pray and, and ask just that the Lord would bless our time. I believe he has something for all of us today, but I believe he especially has something for for those of you, any of us, who may be in a, in a difficult time, maybe there's somebody that's come against us, attacked us recently, and, and the Lord just wants this passage to be a, a healing balm to our souls. Uh, Romans chapter 12, then in verse 20, 14 through 21, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would take this passage of Scripture, take it from the the pages of the Bible and write it on the fleshly tablets of our heart. Lord, remind us of the great forgiveness we've received from you and wash, let your water, the the water of your word wash over our souls today that we might be able to extend grace and forgiveness to others and be so set free, Lord, from the burden of bitterness, Lord, we pray. And Lord, so teach us, speak to us that Christ might be magnified and your people blessed. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Studies have shown that bitter and angry people have higher blood pressure and heart rate and are more likely to die of heart disease and other illnesses. In fact, the the amount of uh, information available on this subject is as robust as it is on whether smoking affects your physical health. It's pretty astounding. I read a secular article, mind you, a secular article this week of of a... college basketball player who faced some some racism when he went off to college. Uh, uh, Kevin Burton, uh, during his sophomore year in in college, uh, was harassed by some of the white students. They were, uh, uh, he and another black basketball player were, uh, their their lockers, or they were being, uh, their doors were being spat upon. They were being, uh, doors loudly knocked on in the middle of the night. Their posters tore up and things along those lines. 
And I want to read a little bit from this story. This was the first time in his life Benton had encountered racism and it hit him hard. He had trouble sleeping and then over the next several months, he suffered panic attacks. Admitted to the hospital, he was found to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or that's the thickening of the, the muscles in the heart. The disease is the leading cause of heart related sudden death in people under 30. So sick he couldn't walk. Benton lay in the hospital bed, bitter and resentful. I thought to myself, I've never hurt anybody. I serve in the community. I work with youth. I wrestled with God. Why did this happen to me? He remembers. The, then, a little, short, a little time later, a janitor walked by and grabbed Benton's arm and prayed aloud to God to heal him. And as soon as she said amen, I felt like someone had poured cold water over me and my heart shrank. Benton forgave the students who had tormented him. And three days later, he walked out of the hospital. He said, if, it, if, I, if I hadn't forgiven them, I'd be dead. And that's something. Secular article, by the way. Article goes on to say this, feeling persistently resentful toward other people, the boss who fired you, the spouse who cheated on you, can indeed affect your physical health. Well, it can. There's that old saying, bitterness is a pill we swallow, hoping it poisons the person that we, or poisonous pill, pill we swallow, hoping, hoping it harms the, the person who has attacked us. So not only does the Lord call us to bless those, to forgive those who have persecuted us for our own sake, for our own blessing, but also for the blessing of the gospel, for the glory of his great name. Because if we are a people who believe and rejoice in and gather Sunday after Sunday to sing of the greatest redemptive story, that God sent his only son to die on the cross for his greatest enemy, the one who persecuted him and attacked him to his death, me. How could I not then carry out that same activity toward those who have attacked me? And so Paul begins here in verse 14. Buckle your seatbelt. Bless those who persecute you. <laughs> Bless and do not curse. Could there be a statement that runs more contrary, a command that runs more contrary to human nature than that? The word persecute means to put to flight. This can either mean a direct attack against yourself or just a rejection of you, a pushing away of you. When somebody ignores you or rejects you, especially in your faith in Christ, we says the exhortation is to bless our persecutors in a sense of returning kindness and love to those who mistreat us because of our testimony in the Lord Jesus. Paul here is advocating that we would bless those who persecute us, who have directly hurt us. This, and it does not only land in Christian to non-Christian connotations, but this can also relate to those persecutions we receive within the church family and even within our own family. And the Bible advocates that when somebody either rejects you, ignores you, pushes you away, or attacks you, is unkind to you, and unfairly hurts you, that your response to them is to bless them. And what does it mean to bless somebody? Well, biblically speaking, the word blessing would have three ideas. Number one, just to do good to somebody. To do them uh, to do good by them, to bless them, to do something favorable for them, would also have the idea of speaking well of somebody, and almost primarily that. In fact, the word bless here is where we get the word eulogy, or to speak kind words about somebody. 
So to bless somebody who's persecuted you, meaning I'm going to do good toward them and I'm going to speak well of them, speak both kindly to them directly and then speak well of them when they're not around to others. And then also would carry with it the idea of praying for them and not praying that they get hit by a truck. (laughs) But praying blessing on them, praying that the Lord would show favor toward them, praying that the Lord would forgive them and be merciful to them, praying for their blessing. So Paul begins with a positive, bless those, do good to, speak well of, and pray favorably for those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Cursing has more than the idea of profanity laced words against them. It would carry with it cursing with the idea of the exact opposite three of doing wrong to them. Don't do that. Don't speak ill of them to others or say any unkind words to them directly. And don't pray harsh things for them. But so bless, do not curse. This is gospel. Who does this? Like, who does this? Jesus. Like, whom of us? Which one of us blesses, speaks well of, prays good over, and does good to those who persecute? It is Jesus and him alone. And if we've been born again and changed by him, then this penetrates the heart of the believer. In fact, as contrary to human nature this is, it's equally contradictory that a Christian would not do this. As contrary to human nature as it is to bless those who persecute us, it's equally as contradictory that a Christian would not bless those who persecute him. Because my calling cry in life is, God is merciful to people who hate him and persecute him. And he sent his only son to die for me. And now I have somebody who's angry at me, has persecuted me, come against me, and I will show him the same kindness my Savior has shown, even if it costs me dearly. (laughs) In fact, this is what's in the Lord's mind in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 44 through 46. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And maybe they just slipped up. No, they didn't just slip up. Pray for those who spitefully, continually use you and persecute you. Wow. Like not a one-time deal. Like it's not fool me one, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. No, this is do good to those who persistently, continually, spitefully use you and persecute you. Why? Verse 45, that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. This is, this is how you'll be known on earth that you're God's child, that you do as he does, that you're sons of your Father in heaven. For he does this. He makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends crop-producing rain and earth replenishment for the just as well as the unjust. He does good to all people. The warm sun that you experience and you recognize as a blessing from the Lord is the same sun that is warming your enemies by God's providential choice. It's not just that it happened to live on planet Earth where he sent out his sun to warm you. No, the Lord sent it to warm them as well. And he does good to those who hate him. For if you love those who love you, and only Jesus can ask a question like this, like, 
And for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same. Like, Lord, could you get any more personal? Jesus just simply says, uh, can I ask you a question? Um, if you do good to people that do good to you and you speak well of people that you think highly of and, and you are kind to people that are kind to you, big whoop de doo Everybody does that. Even guys in prison do that. But if you actively do good, speak well of, pray blessing over people that are cruel and mean to you, well, then you're more like me because that's what I do, the Lord says. So we're to speak evil of no one. Why, why, why? Titus 3, 2 through 4 tells us, speak evil of no one. Be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Why, why, why? Verse 3 tells us, because we ourselves also were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But the kindness of God. But when the kindness and love of God toward men appeared on, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So that's why I don't speak evil of others. Even if, the, the, as the Christian that would say that. Why? Because, because I realize that what, no matter what kind of harm and hatred they're showing toward my name, Unless God had interrupted my life and I was living in that same course just as he. And unless God had interrupted my life, I'd be, I'd be on the road to hell. But God showed me kindness. So instead of speaking evil of that individual, that institution, I will speak well of them. I will pray good over them. I will be kind to them. Hey, here's a song for you to sing and some homework, especially if this runs deep and you have a recent hurt or an ongoing or long time hurt that just doesn't seem to go away. I would encourage you to, to Google evolution worship the song, The Blessing. It's taken from Numbers uh, chapter six. And you know it, it's the high priestly blessing. But put that person in your mind that's hurt you so much and sing this song over them. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his face toward you and give you peace. And may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. And ultimately, that's only ever going to come into somebody's life through the gospel, that they know him. And so you're praying that they, they'd be saved if they do not know him and that they'd be blessed. Hey, that's gospel music. <laughs> that's gospel music. God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He prayed for the highest blessing on those who were presently persecuting him. He reached down and picked up them. He greeted Judas in that selfsame moment with the words friend, as Judas was actively betraying him. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean uh, being kind to difficult people, but this could mean being kind to people when it's difficult to do so. Meaning when you're high and they're low or you're, but you're just in a really tough spot and they're just in a really good spot. They've had rejoice with those who rejoice. Which one's harder? Rejoice with those who rejoice or weep with those who weep? Probably the first one. The second one, even if things, no matter how swimmingly things are going for you, when somebody's really hurting, there's, most of us have the capacity to at least, hey, put my smile off and, 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 and condescend and, and, and weep with this person. But when things are going very poorly for you and somebody has a celebration, sometimes it can be really hard. When everybody's having a baby and you're still unable to or always a bridesmaid and never a bride and then another girl gets a ring on it. 
and you are having trouble saying, I'm happy for you. Congratulations. And what the Bible just advocates is that we put ourselves aside. That we just think less of ourselves in our own world. And we just think about others. And that we rejoice with people when they're rejoicing. And that we weep with those when they're weeping. As Jesus did in John 11.35, our shortest verse in the English Bible, Jesus wept. And it tells us that his weeping showed his love. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And the Lord allows us to go through trials so that we can then comfort others. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Right there it says he's the God of all comfort. He comforts us. He weeps with us. He keeps our tears in a bottle. But then so, and then God. And so the Lord weeps with those who weeps. He rejoices with those who rejoice. Hey, a trouble shared is only half a trouble. But a joy that's shared is a joy that's doubled. When something good goes on, you want to share it with somebody. And when people celebrate with you, it heightens your joy. And when you're suffering and somebody shares it with you, it decreases your sorrow. Well, so it's not so much here in this verse being kind to difficult people, but maybe just being kind to people when they're in a difficult place or being kind to them when you're in a difficult place. And then the next verse says, uh, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. You're not all you're, you're cracked up to be, bub. Hang out with difficult people. Again, this has nothing to do with maybe somebody that has done something against you. But let's all be honest. We have our circles. We have our friends and our cliques and people that we like and people that, hey, hanging out with this guy just kind of does it for me. You know, we get to talk and chat. We like all the same stuff. And, but hanging out with that fellow well, it takes a little bit of work for me. But we are to be of the same mind toward one another. We're not to set our mind on high things, but we're associate, to associate with the humble. Really, don't be too proud to associate with people of low position. Maybe they're lower than you financially or economically. Or they, they don't measure up intellectually. They don't stimulate you intellectually in a conversation. Or socially, there's this status. We still live by it. Where is everybody ranked? It's crazy. It's from high school here. And our, our, our high school there in Detroit, Michigan, always had this. And from there was the top five. You know, everybody would vote. All the kids in the high school would vote. Like, who are the top 25 seniors? And then the top five. And then you'd from that have the king and the queen, right? But what do you mean the top 25? Like the top, well, what does that mean to be top? Like, obviously, what we're talking about is the top 25 most popular, likable, best dressed, athletes, humorous. Like, hey, you made the ranking and somebody else didn't. And we never really lose that. Like, who, do, who, would, who would ever rank somebody socially, economically, you know? It, like, we do it all the time. And the Lord says, this has no place within the church. James 2, 1 through 4 says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man with filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing fine clothes and say to him, Hey, you sit here in a good place. But then you say to the poor man, Oh, you just stand over there. Don't bug me. Or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality and become judges with evil thoughts? Why does, the, why does James have to write this into the scripture? Because the Lord needs to remind us, hang out with people, all of them. Spend time with them. Cross the room and talk to them. Whether they have a certain scent, whether you think you gain something from the conversation, or whether you're the primary giver. 
cross social boundaries, social statuses. Yeah, this doesn't even, this does, just doesn't going from high to low on what the world might consider high to low. God certainly doesn't rank <laughs> rich people dressed. You work at McDonald's and the other guy owns his own business with 500 employees. I'm not going to say hi to him. He wouldn't give me the hand. Hey, how are you today? My name's Ted. And we just meet people. We minister to people. We love people. And that's what scripture says. And think about it. If you were really a prophet, I don't know if he'd allow this. Her hair and washing them with her tears. And, and you know what? Just the Lord says, be of the same mind toward it. Don't think of yourself too highly. Don't be wise in your own opinion. Don't be a legend in your own mind. Don't think of yourself as better than others. And then repay, verse 17, re circling back to that first thought. Do not repay evil for evil. Re repay no one evil for evil, but rather have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And the idea here is that obviously two wrongs don't make a right. Three lefts do, but two wrongs don't. The call here is that we would not do something evil to someone who has done something evil to us. This does not, this verse does not say res, do not resolve conflict. This, this verse does not say just ignore trouble if it's ever come. The Bible gives us wonderful principles on how we are to resolve conflict. And, and maybe the be, one of the best ones is from Matthew 18 where it says, if your brother has offended you, go to your brother and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if the brother's overtaken a trespass, restore such a one with a spirit of gentleness, humility, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So I'm not spreading gossip. I'm not, I'm not attacking his character. It's not like I got punched in the face and I'm socking him back. It's saying, hey, I was offended. And I, the, the Bible gives me some ways that I can work through that conflict. But Jesus got very specific here, and he said, if someone smites you on one cheek, slaps you on one cheek, just turn to him the other also. If someone sues you and wants to take away your cloak, let him have your tunic also. If somebody compels you to go one mile, like against your will, say, how about a second? Somebody hurts you, robs from you, takes from you. What else can I give you? Like again, who does this sort of thing? Jesus. Mercy's not getting what we do deserve. And it wouldn't, what's not even evil, wouldn't even be wrong of the Lord to throw us all into hell. It would be just. But in his mercy, he saves us from it. And then in his grace, he topples us with kindness and blessing in life. And so repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. That really helps us understand it. Like just let your works be good and honorable to the Lord. If somebody has done something evil against you, let your good works be a response. Let your kindness, your humility, your good speech, your, your favor. And Peter helps us here in 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. When he's talking about fleshly lust here in verse 11, he He's specifically aiming at the lusts of anger and outbursts of wrath that are so prone to the human heart. Of course, there's other lusts that war against our soul as well. But the whole point of Peter, 1 Peter, is do good to those who are persecuting you wrongfully. In the next verse, he helps us understand it. Have your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation, that they would see that your works are good and honorable, not outbursts of wrath. And also 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9, this brings a blessing back to you. 
Finally, all of you be of one mind, have compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous. So now he's talking about within the body of Christ and in verse nine, not returning evil for evil to one another as Christians or reviling for reviling, but rather on the contrary, a blessing. Know that you are, knowing that you were called to this, that you also may inherit a blessing. If somebody has hurt you, the worst thing that you can do for yourself is to rehearse that in your mind, to think about all the things that they've done to you and to think bitter thoughts and angry thoughts to them. That's the worst thing you could do for yourself personally. The best thing you can do for yourself personally is to be reminded that Jesus died for you and your sins are forgiven and then forgive them with that same way. And what's gonna happen is this, this love of the Lord will just pour over your heart and you'll be freed from that. You'll be freed from that bitterness that you have against them. It's like you can put down the boxing gloves. Now you might have to do that a time or two <laughs> every minute for the rest of your life if you have some real deep hurts. But I tell you what, the Lord, the Lord really works it out. Well, the verse, verse 18 then says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. This verse is also very helpful within this process because what it's saying is that, that if it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably. Peace means when there are two people that are no longer at war that are now together, Okay. Just as it takes two to tango, it takes two to be at peace. You can't have peace with somebody who wants to rip your face off unless they change, right? But you can do everything to do to, to make peace with them, to kindly go to them, to extend an offering, to wave the white flag, to do what's right. You, as much as, as possible, don't do evil toward them. Don't fuel the, the, the fire of this, this feud, but rather do everything you can to make peace. And if they make peace with you, great. Then you can be at peace. But as much as is possible, live at peace with all men. Do your part. James 3.18, now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Quick question, what do we call those that make peace? Peacemakers, that's right. They make peace. That's what they make. <laughs> Be a peacemaker. Do your part. And you say, but does this mean like, they're just gonna get away with it? You just told me to bless people that are persecuting me and be kind to people that hate me and they're just gonna get away with it? No, there's one who will settle the score one day. And that's why the very next verse, we can't overlook the very first word. It's a very easy word, all these introductory words, very easy for us to overlook. But would you look down at the first verse of, of verse 20 there, or verse 19 there? Beloved, beloved. Why does, why does Paul want to interject the word beloved right here? because the information that's been shared is very hard for us to hear. It almost seems like God doesn't love me if he doesn't care that I'm being hurt, that God doesn't love me, that, and he's asking, how could a loving God ask me to be kind to somebody who's really hurting me? Well, he loves you so much, that's why he's asking you to do it. Beloved, you're loved by God, and you're loved by the Apostle Paul. <laughs> Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Don't take it upon yourself to settle the account, but rather give place to wrath or proper place to wrath or vengeance. Uh, say, okay, I need the person in charge here to take care of this situation for me. And I'm not going to take the law into my own hands. Who's that? Oh, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Okay, there's a God in heaven sovereignly who sees all things and he can settle the score. So I'll do this. If my enemy is hungry, I'll feed him. If he's thirsty, okay, I'm not going to rejoice. I'm going to rather give him something to drink. For in, do, in, do, in doing so, in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. 
Whatever does that mean? Well, there's been no end to the discussion of what it could mean, but I think the simplest reading of it, the way it would naturally be read by all of us is best, and that's that it would heap this burning conviction on his head, that he would feel very badly and, and, and repent therein. I still remember fourth grade trip to the zoo, Detroit Zoo, at the very end of the year. It was the year-end field trip. Mrs. Serdaki, poor Mrs. Serdaki. She was a little bit of a hard fourth grade teacher, but she was a good teacher. I was in a really bad spot that year. My dad, was, uh, my dad had spent the year in the, in, uh, in the state prison for armed robbery, and I was kind of like really in a bad spot. And I gave Miss Serdaki the worst time I think any kid could ever give his teacher. I spent half the year in the hallway, okay? And, uh, and so we had a few run-ins. And at the end of the year, at there at the Detroit Zoo, I didn't have any money for lunch and all the kids are getting food. And uh, she went up, she bought my lunch for me, sat right next to me, like kindness. And I was like, I was like, I've been so mean to you. <laughs> and it's just like, that's, that's what won my heart. She was a little bit of a rough teacher. Don't get me wrong. But it wasn't her rod that won my heart. I wouldn't be talking about her today if it was just the rod. It was her kindness. And the scripture says, you just give place to wrath. Here's your job. Let the Lord deal with them. You show kindness to them. How about that? How about verse 21? Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And there's none good but God. And his goodness is the highest goodness. And his grace is what we sing about. And it's what we rejoice in. And so the next time somebody's hurting you, you go to the Lord. And you remind yourself of his favor, incredible and far-reaching. That he's blessed you presently. And he'll bless you stretching on and through eternity not for the sake of your works, but on the sheer basis of his and his alone, that Christ died and rose again to give life to a sinner like you. First Peter 2.20 says, What credit is it if when you're beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. 1 Peter 2.23 tells us this is what Jesus did, who when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, but by, by, that, by him, by our stripes, by his stripes, we might be healed. And so, let the gospel wash over our souls today. And if there is somebody that you're embittered against, having trouble with, would you do good to them? Would you speak well of them? Would you pray for them? Lord, thank you for the gospel. We just thank you that you died on the cross, Lord, for our sin. You rose again to give us life. And we're not the only miserable sinners that you love. In fact, you love all of those sinners that have sinned against us as much as you love us. And so, Lord, we pray that you would do them the good that you've done for us that you would show them the kindness that you've shown toward us, that you'd open their eyes and bring them into a relationship with Christ, that their sins might be forgiven, their names written in heaven, that your name might be glorified, that your kingdom would be full of folks like us, unworthy sinners, 
saved by the grace of God. We love you, Lord. Father, I pray for any this morning that have never received that gift of grace of Jesus, our Redeemer, that even right now that you'd bring them to a place of confession of sin and humble repentance before you, that they'd call on your name, you'd wash them clean. And if that's you today, just call on his name and say, Jesus, forgive me. Have mercy on me. Come into my heart and make me new. I confess I've sinned against you and I thank you that you died and you rose again to give me life. Come into my life and I want to forgive others as I've been forgiven. And I want to be healed. So call on his name. He'll come in and he'll change you forever. Lord, we love you. Help us, Lord, to forgive others as we've been forgiven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.